Region of Durham is one of our keynotes. They've been a big sponsor and supporter of the Spark Center since our inception. And where is the Spark team? Please put up your hands and give a wave so we get to see Michelle and Andrew and Christy and Christina. They're all hiding up here. Thank you guys for all the work you guys do behind the scenes. I met Spencer in 2014, maybe 2015, when he was a student at UIT. UIT has what they call the Brilliant Incubator. And in the Brilliant Incubator, they get brilliant students who have great ideas to come in and put their idea on paper and try to turn it into a business model. And I think from that year, you were the only guy who actually turned what you had thought about doing into it. So I'm really happy that we were able to get Spencer. He's been in Vancouver most of his time. Uh, so I called him up a month ago and I said, Spencer, when's the next time you're in Toronto, in Oshawa? And he said he was leaving on June the 13th. And I said, what are you doing June 12th? <laughs> <laughs> so he took a GO train out this morning. UIT grabbed him. And he had to do a photo shoot for Poster Boy at UIT because of his successes there. And then he did a corporate meeting with his Peterborough staff down here in Oshawa. And then we brought him in to speak with us tonight. So please welcome Spencer Turbert, CEO of IOBACA. contest a number of years ago. Uh, he became a Spark client and we've actually continued to work together over the years even though he's been now in Vancouver, Toronto and Ottawa, uh, Peterborough. He's a serial entrepreneur who started with a lemonade stand from what I've been told. From a lemonade stand he went to college pro painting and a lot of people who do college pro painting don't get very far. Well, he did $275,000 in business. I think you were number two? Uh, it depends on the area. In, on, in Ontario, I think you are number, uh, I don't know, there were a lot of top performers. We were, we were around the top 10 now Good. in Ontario. And then during university, you formed Iopotheca, yes. which is in the pharmacy space. And I had to laugh because I was meeting with Spencer up at UIT one time. And he said, I got a problem, Bob. I've got a project due and I gotta do a sales call. So I've gotta go see my prof first and get an exemption to get the project done later so I can go on the sales call and make some money so I can afford to go to university. That's true, isn't it? It is, and the professors were always great to let you go if you told them why. They, they found it to be a good reason, so they gave me a lot of leeway that way. Yeah. Self-professed healthcare, hair test, speaker, young entrepreneur, and dream chaser and my friend Spencer. Thank you very much for joining us today, Spencer. Thanks guys for having me. So let's start by talking about Iapotheca. Tell everybody about the company. Yeah, so we started Iapotheca when I was halfway through university and towards, towards my fourth year last year. I graduated in 2015 from UIT here in Oshawa and uh, at the time we were building different software solutions for businesses and we realized that there's a lot of software companies out there and it would be best if we had the best chance of building uh, a real business if we could focus on a specific area. And at the time, we were working with a couple pharmacies in Oshawa and Peterborough area uh, and in a couple other areas to build solutions that would help take day-to-day -day operations and tasks and digitalize them and make, make them more efficient. So we decided, after seeing how behind the times some areas of healthcare, especially pharmacy, were, that there was a lot of area to improve those operations. And so we started building tools for pharmacies at that time, which for a long time, uh, we built tools that we thought would improve the business in these pharmacies, as opposed to actually talking to them, and talking to more than just a few pharmacists, and that was our first big mistake. But eventually we got around that, and, uh, and uh, built some tools that were recognized and uh, helpful to every pharmacy in Canada. So what was that original team what did it look like? So our original team looked like four founding team members uh, in Peterborough and Oshawa. 
and uh, a couple myself, I came from college pro painters and while doing that university and kind of a sales and marketing uh, and finance background and mindset and then uh, our other partners came from a technology and project management uh, and computer programming background. And did they volunteer? Did you go out and find them? Did you guys create the idea together? What was kind of the synthesis of that team? When we first began, we didn't really know, well, we definitely didn't know what we were doing. Um, we didn't really know what it was going to end up being. So we, we'd come up with a business idea called, actually a completely different business idea called Artly Rewards. And it was a uh, student-run rewards-based program to, uh, if you're familiar with what Google and Facebook advertising is like, we had a concept where you could run competitions to create word of mouth online uh, endorsements amongst a group of people in a local area to promote local businesses as opposed to Google and Facebook ads. And uh, uh, it, we never really launched that. We built the software and everything, and by the time we were done, it was the end of a university school year, and we, we didn't want to wait till the next year, just till September, to get started. So uh, that's when we started working more in pharmacy, and that kind of uh, took us in a new direction. So. Could you say we failed at that idea? Um, possibly. We really never gave it a shot, unfortunately. So, and so I thought it started in Peterborough. Yes, in Oshawa. And you're at the university, yeah. So tell us about some of those early wins or early failures as you were building the company. So uh, I used to drive. Basically, I have class. I was. In I was in business, so I was lucky enough that I had the lowest number of class hours of any faculty. I had like nine on a good semester to 15 or 16 on a bad semester hours of class, which compared to engineers, uh, if anybody here went to school for engineering, they were in class like 45 hours a week. So um, basically at, at, at lunchtime, i drive downtown Oshawa, I'd meet up with our part, one of our partners, and we'd sit in a car and cold call pharmacies like for two hours basically throughout the lunch hour. We did that a few days a week um, with the first few tools that we had that we thought could improve their operations. And uh, it was about eight months of absolutely no success doing that. Like, we maybe booked three product demonstrations in eight months doing that while we were in school. And that's when we started to realize that we were talking to a couple pharmacies and trying to solve their problems versus talk to, you know, 100 pharmacies or 500 pharmacies in Canada and see what would be applicable to all of them. When we arrived here tonight at five o'clock, there's a pharmacy right across the street. And I gotta tell you the dedication of this guy. He walked in and he said, can I borrow the keys to the car? I drove him up from the, uh, the, where we were meeting. And he zipped out to my car, he grabbed his business card, grabbed his book, and he walked across the road to the pharmacy and he did a sales call before he came in. So that's one of the things that's always impressed me about Spencer is the drive and dedication that he's got from the start in terms of, you know, there's an opportunity instead of sitting back and going, well, you know, we'll get around to it later. You, you seem to have that drive. Well, yeah, we had, you know, we had some time to kill and it only took me 10 minutes to, to find out that Belmer wasn't there, but I got his direct number and his business card, so that's a start to uh, take advantage of what we're here in person. <laughs> always take the opportunity, always be looking for the, for the next one. So let, let's go back a bit. Um, you talked about as a, as a young person you were involved in doing the lemonade stand, college pro. Have you always seen yourself as being an entrepreneur or is it just a drive? What, was, what, what drives you? I never understood like what the word entrepreneurship meant until first year university when I started college pro. And um, previous to that though, you know, I think a lot of kids do lemonade stands when they're younger, uh, or if the stores are lemonade, you know, punch, you know, uh, punch stands like fruit punch stands, um, whatever it took to buy the money to get the candy. Um, and so uh, I did that, and then I, I, I never really knew I was doing entrepreneurial things. I'd spent so much time. I was doing a lot of activities that were expensive for like a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old or a 16-year-old, so I had to find ways to make money to pay for those activities. And uh, um, basically, I would be doing you know, cutting lawn, shoveling snow, picking up sticks, uh, and it helps as a kid because right now, like if you went around and knocked on people's doors and asked them to pay you a toonie to pick up 
has fixed it in the past year if you were, you know, like what, what your problem was basically. Yeah. But when you're when you're little, that actually works. So uh, I do anything like to try and to try and like get a couple dollars or five dollars, ten dollars, fifty dollars, etc. And then eventually, um, one of the activities that I did that was costing so much money was competitive paintball. Uh, believe it or not, when you think of what paintball is, it's probably not what competitive paintball is. Competitive paintball, you're in a small area with air-filled uh, objects, and uh, it's very different from the out in the woods. And uh, because that was expensive, I started to understand that people were always trying to buy gear. So I started going on like Craigslist, Kijiji, and other areas, buying 100 to 200 dollars worth of paintball gear, and then just selling each thing individually for like double the price. And uh, and, and it worked because on Kijiji you're trying to or let go, you're trying to get rid of uh, trying to get rid of stuff quickly. So that's kind of when I started doing that, like from from like 15 to 17, that was really working pretty well. Not sustainably because there wasn't enough stuff. I lived in Owen Sound, Ontario, and grew up there, so there's not enough people to go and buy from. It wasn't like I was in Toronto. <laughs> so what's the current status of Iopotheca? And let's talk a bit about the morph with Herotest. Yeah, so uh, we started Iapothka when I, sorry, we started in 2014, but when I graduated in May of 2015 from UIT here, we took a team of four or five people, partners, or a full time, uh, brought on a tiny bit of seed money, um, not a ton of seed money, took a team of four or five people, part or full time, uh, and for about eight months we were burning a lot of money with very little results, because we were still trying to sell, the, sell tools to people without really, um, understanding that they weren't applicable to the entire market. And then by the end of 2015, started 2016, things started to pick up. Uh, we released what was called a narcotic reconciliation tool. That sounds pretty dry. If it does, it's because it is pretty dry. It's basically a sophisticated calculator that would help pharmacies self-audit uh, what was coming in and out of their pharmacy from a serious drug point of view, narcotic point of view, uh, in order to make sure that they things weren't going unaccounted. And with new regulations and things, this was becoming more and more popular. So between then and now, we put that tool and a couple others in about 1,400 pharmacies across Canada. And then leading up to fast forwarding about two years, uh, we, uh, we realized that there's only so many pharmacies in Canada. So we looked at the states and we said, can any of our tools be applicable to the United States market? Some of them could a little bit, the most popular one really couldn't because pharmacies were still only required legally to reconcile once every year or two years in the states. So to pay for a software as a service tool like ourselves to use it once every two years didn't really make sense. So we basically took this customer base and thought and, and went to some conferences in the US and said what can we create that has a bigger market scope. And we entered what is traditionally a very competitive space which is task management software. But we saw a gap. And that was, um, if you have heard of task management softwares in the market like Trello, Asana, Write, Basecamp, these different companies, they were meant primarily for individuals or small and medium sized teams. But we didn't see a lot be out there available for medium and large sized teams. So that could be anyone with 20 or more employees, even 50, 100, even 5,000 employees. So we built what's now called Hero Task, which is, we believe is the most scalable task management platform on the planet, where if you have a head office in multiple locations across the company, the country, sorry, you could assign a task to tens, hundreds, or even thousands of people in under a minute and get real-time results of who's completing what and direct reporting back and forth between employees and managers. So all these managers and these businesses that typically spend you know, 70 to 80 percent of their day on the phone and in their email inbox could could drastically cut down the amount of time they were spending doing those sorts of things to really build collaboration and productivity in their organizations. So, quick question: How many people in the audience are entrepreneurs? A few entrepreneurs, good. And how many are servicing entrepreneurs? Are they on the other side? Okay. So, the, the the challenge always when you're in the entrepreneurial space. Do you invent a completely new mousetrap, or do you just modify the existing mousetrap? Is HeroTask a new invention, or is it just a better development of, of what's out there? 
I'd say it's a it's a better development of what's out there. It's it's a development for a new area. So task management is really growing in, in businesses, and uh, it's it's growing all over the world uh, for for individuals, small you know five ten people in a department in a company, but. There aren't near as many companies out there tackling the large, uh, larger organizations where you're trying to managers are trying to communicate and track work productively back and forth between a few managers and tens or hundreds of people, and so that's where we really saw a gap. And uh, not only that, we saw a lack of security in these sorts of systems. So our platforms HIPAA and HIPAA to compliance. You can actually put both healthcare and financial information in our platform, and all of that's encrypted. So the way that pharmacies, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, all these sorts of businesses before and organizations couldn't communicate by email and still follow regulations, uh, they can within our platform. So it opens up a whole new world as far as um, improving productivity in, in healthcare spaces and retail spaces like, like grocery stores, which our product is also used and one of my favorites is there's a real push today with entrepreneurs that social media is going to sell everything. All I have to do is blog enough, put enough articles out there, put enough on LinkedIn, put enough on Facebook. Do you want to make a give a few comments on how you've built your sales? Yeah, both iApotheca as well as iApotheca is a little more funny because uh, back with iApotheca, we got our first. Uh, we got our first few sales by, by cold calling, but then after that, we started to ramp things up by faxing. faxing Say that again. Faxing. Fax broadcasting in 2017, right? Two, well, yeah, 2014, 15, 16, 17, yeah, so, or 4, 15, 16, 17. So we were faxing when we started, you know, tens or hundreds of people, and eventually we were faxing thousands of people that were, that were in our databases, and, uh, we had got permission from every single one to fax for the record in the camera back. <laughs> uh, and uh, so yeah, we were faxing and it was around the time when the government had announced an article saying $14 million in funding is going towards increased auditors to audit pharmacies to make sure they're tracking their narcotics safely and securely. So we, we took that headline and we faxed out are you ready for all the inspections that are about to come to your pharmacy and look at your narcotics and everything? Sure enough, in the first 30, sorry, the first three hours that we faxed out to a lot of pharmacies in Ontario, uh, we received 60 faxes back with their information filled out going, mm -hmm. I want a demo or I want more information. So that's when we really started to see things turn and, uh, uh, and, and that's, that's really how we started going with iAponica. But all of Iapontica sales, every single one ever that, that we got through through our initial pharmacy tools were outbound sales. They were cold calling, email, not even LinkedIn then. It was just cold calling, email, and making those calls to the pharmacy owners, the pharmacy managers, and other people, a um, certain amount per day, reaching a certain amount of decision makers, having a certain amount of those convert to a demo, and then a sale. And, uh, now with HeroTask, we've started to implement for the first time our inbound marketing strategy, and but we're still entirely outbound for the most part, and uh, that's still cold calling, that's emailing. Now we're implementing LinkedIn and social selling opportunities because LinkedIn is a, a tremendous platform that is currently unsaturated. Unlike Instagram, Facebook, and other areas where um, there's a lot of influencers, there's a lot of these different things. LinkedIn is a huge ground for building connections uh, because. You can build, you can connect and request to connect with people um, on LinkedIn and if they connect back with you, then they're automatically a follower to you and your content, which is very powerful. To give you an idea of what that looks like, and Bob's had a ton of success with LinkedIn too, is um, in the last year alone, I went from having about 500 LinkedIn followers to about 18,000, and that was just from spending time each day, 10 minutes, on the bus, in an Uber, uh, not in my car, unless somebody was driving it, <laughs> uh, adding people in my industry and sending a customized message saying that I'd love to connect and I'd love to share knowledge and you know, I, I see that you have experience in this area, let's connect. And so it did not take long to get to that many followers and 
Um, if you look at you know, what the leading number of people with followers is in Canada, it's not that high. Like, the leader is only a few hundred thousand followers on LinkedIn. So it's a very unsaturated platform, and it's amazing for, for building business. When you think about using LinkedIn, you're using the Sales Navigator. And uh, so you've pretty much put a system in place, haven't you, in terms of how you reach out to all your clients? It's not a very haphazard way. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we fine-tuned that system for our previous pharmacy tools, and now we're in the process of fine-tuning it for our new task management platform and product. And uh, what that looks like is basically, um, basically kind of a workflow of you know seven to twelve touch points, where over the course of twenty days you you contact somebody you know anywhere from seven to twelve times, and amongst phone calls, voicemail, LinkedIn, and Emails in the right order, in a non-intrusive manner, in a way that they can always opt out or unsubscribe from what you're trying to do to contact them, and uh, that's what that's what we've been working on. Challenges you've come into so far? Let's talk a bit about financing because that's a, a big thing for entrepreneurs when they come to the Spark Center. Well, I think the first question we get is how much money can I find? <laughs> and uh, poor Michelle, she answered that phone call and says, "Good luck." And you've looked at investment, you've looked at bringing investors in, you've looked at A-series rounds, things like that. Where did you kind of end up going with that? So we raised a small amount of, of seed investment in early 2015, 2016 between uh, two different rounds of, of only a hundred and something thousand each and uh, that did not keep the lights on for very long because with a software business you're having to support customers which means you know, people being able to answer the phone. So you need, you know, five staff members, six staff members, etc. And uh, so we do odd jobs here, there, and everywhere to keep the lights on uh, outside of that small inv seed investment. So we did go the seed investment route, and for a long time since then, uh, we became profitable or, or back and forth on the prop. You know, you, you're profitable, and then you spend a bunch to get ahead, and then you're profitable again. And uh, since then. Um, we made the decision that with this new product that we we're going to build it up to a certain point do a series A investment round. And that's our goal, um, to, to be done at some point in the next year is to do a series A investment round and really scale our new task management platform to the, to the next level. Um, I would say it really depends on um, it really depends on the type of product you have in the industry or in SaaS. Um, in the early days, keep as much equity as you can, give away as little as possible, and get the product to the point where it's doing between 500,000 and 1.5 million in sales. If you can get to that point by giving away you know, less than 50% of your company, fantastic. It's gonna put you in a position that's terrific if you have to, either if you want to just keep your equity and move forward with the business and continue bootstrapping, or if you want to raise a Series A investment round of you know, two million to six million dollars and, and grow the business that you've got some to work with. So word to the wise out here, checkbooks will be open at the end of the session. So you can uh, write it out, start on your start on your investments and get the yeah. discount on next year's series. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what makes you feel good as a founder of a business? Where do you where do you see yourself? Uh, like as far as what are the good days and the bad days? Yeah. That are, uh, there's, there's, it depends. When you launch a new product, when you're when you're moving along really well, you're growing. And uh, you're growing, you're doing really well, and then you decide to go back and launch a new product and go through all those awful starting headaches again. Those are where more bad, there's more bad days than good days, uh, which has been the last three to four months. It's stressful because we're trying to um, we're trying to scale at the same speed with a new product that we did with a previous product when we haven't been in the market years long with the new product. So. You know, there's good days and bad days. What I like the most is that, you know, we, uh, being in entrepreneurship, you just get to choose what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Then there's the joke if you work 100 hours a week, so that you don't have, to, so that you get to choose when you work. But uh, yeah, that doesn't really work either. It's a, it's a myth. <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. When uh, another we hear quite frequently, Spark Center, somebody comes in, they've got a great idea, but they're like. 
I can't tell anyone because they're going to steal it. <laughs> so are, are you one who believes in you keep it completely quiet or do you get out there and, and try to prove the model first? 5% of the time or less, maybe like 2% of the time, you should keep an idea quiet. And that's if you're like in something like biochemical, you know, advancements that are patentable and it's going to be the next thing to, to cure a disease, then keep it quiet. Everything else it doesn't matter. The idea is like 2% and the execution is everything. It, it just doesn't matter at all um, as far as who hears the ideas and whatnot, especially in technology and SaaS. Uh, 10 years ago, you could patent stuff easier in software, and I know this because we visited it with our, with our lawyers and things. Now it's very difficult. Our, the advice we were given was, was don't even worry about trying to patent it. Just, just go into the market, compete, and be faster than the others. Don't spend $25,000, $40,000 over the course of two to six years trying to, trying to get a patent going, unless it's something that is truly, you are truly able to protect, which is getting harder and harder with software. When did you start to do your hiring in your process? I know you, you started small, and then as you kind of moved out, you did a lot of little plays in there. When did the company start to realize it's time to bring on salespeople, bring on customer service? Yeah, for the salespeople, I would say it was when, when we could sell ourselves, when we were selling a certain amount of contacts ourselves, and we could see that happening. Um, support was when calls were coming in, and you know, when we were starting to get eight calls a day, 10 calls a day, 15 calls a day, and the founders were trying to do other things to grow the business at a faster pace, and taking those calls were taking up a quarter of the day or half of the day, and it was increasing more and more. So that's when we started to look for support team members. Um, the SaaS, software as a service SaaS and technology is very tricky because unlike a number of other businesses, when you're growing, you never have money to spare, ever. If you have money to spare, you're doing something wrong or you're just getting incredibly lucky, in my opinion. There's a, you always need more money than you have or, or one of two things is gonna happen. You, if you're doing well, you're going to, one of two things is gonna happen. You're gonna get bought out probably by, by another competitor or something or somebody else that wants to buy you probably for less in the first five to seven years of a business than you'd like to sell it for or you're going to um, you're going to get, you know, once somebody actually sees your success in a niche that's bigger and whatnot, they're going to try and crush you within that niche. So, um, does that mean that everybody should look to raise investment in Series A and whatnot? No. But my advice would be to just give away in these seed rounds in early days, give away as little as possible, and, uh, and then once you are truly ready to scale, then give away what you need to to get the money you need to help grow it. Did you have any trouble when you started to move from Canada into the U.S. with the products? Uh, yeah, that was a bit of a funny story because I was talking at Mohawk College uh, two, a year and a half ago to two years ago, and I was talking about how we were about to try and start selling to U.S. customers, and uh, and we had no clue how to how to do it. And I said, I was talking to 800 students, and I said, I want 100 percent certainty in two years from now we'll be in a whole bunch of U.S stores because I felt the same way about Canada two years before that. I didn't know how we were going to get into pharmacies in Canada. In the, the most ironic thing happened, as I walked off stage, my phone vibrated, I picked it up, and there was a store, and they were like, yeah, I'm in Virginia, and uh, I, I was on your website, and I saw this, can you offer this to us? And uh, when you're in healthcare, there's a lot of regulations, but the answer right away is, yeah, we can sell it to you, absolutely. But there's a you know, typically there's a, we deploy people the next day on your platform for when they come on board with us or even the same day. My answer to them was we can get you deployed in three days. And the reason was I had to call every privacy office, our team did every ever every privacy office and every like provincial regulatory thing that had to do with healthcare information in that state and federally to make sure we comply with everything in the next three days because I wasn't gonna lose the first customer, even though it was small, I was going to lose the first customer just because we couldn't follow the regulations, right? So, you know, the trick is just uh, fake it till you make it and, <laughs> and, and, and solve things as you need to versus trying to be ahead of everything. There are things you want to be proactive versus reactive on, but a lot of them in entrepreneurship you just have to solve along the way and that's the fastest way to do it. You're, it's, 
things aren't ever really going to be fifty. I, I think that brings us to one of the things we hear: engineer syndrome, where they have built the product and then they look at the product and go, "Wow, if I just do this, it'll be this much better." And if I just do this, it'll be much, much better. And they spend all their time focusing on building the next iteration of the product. And what ends up happening is when they finally have three or four developments done, they've spent $100,000, $150,000 or more, depending. They realize they haven't got anything. The market hasn't told them that that's what they need. They're just believing as engineers that's what they need. Yeah, and that's, that's a constant battle because you do, if you do it, how I believe and how we believe it is the right way, which is continuing those advancements while selling what you have every step of the way. Um, uh, it, your development team really uh, goes head to head with you sometimes. So, you know, our, my, my business partners, Dave and Rochelle, uh, Dave is our CTO, and, uh, uh, you know, we're selling every version of the software as we go. We're continuing to add to it and everything right from day one. And that's really challenging because. Uh, you need to have a product that's, that, from a testing point of view, is good enough that it's not going to look bad and people are going to want to stop using it the second they start. But at the same time, you need to um, have enough features that they're going to want to continue using it. You also need sales to keep the lights on. So, a lot of people ask me, this is kind of going to a different question, Bob, but a lot of people ask me, um, if I'm a salesperson or it's a business kind of side of things and I'm looking for a founding partner, or I'm a tech person and I'm looking for a founding partner, what amount of equity should I give them? My answer is always equal. If you expect a founder to give an equal amount of effort that you're going to when you're starting the business, equal. That's what we did right from the start, was equal across our four, our four founding members. One of them eventually left the business and we bought their shares. So three people, then it's equal. And, and that is the best way to do it because then everybody has an equal stake in the company and is equally motivated and is put in an equal amount of hours and if you're, you can hold them accountable to putting in an equal amount of hours is a better way of putting it. And that has worked out so well for us. So if you're looking for a founder on the tech side, the sales side, vice versa, look for somebody that is willing to be as committed as you are and give them an equal share in the business. That's just my opinion. People do it in all sorts of different ways. That's what we're doing. When you started bringing on people, you I got to see your Facebook posts and things. Talk about a bit about some of the motivational things you've done. I know you go you do trips and you have pizza nights and like how do you yeah. get around it? It's hard because like if you work at Google, you know, the amenities you have at Google are ridiculous. We can never ever compete with that. You've got laundry service, you've got every meal of the day catered for free, you've got Know, outings, you, you name it, you've got it. Um, and then there's other startups that are having more and more of these cool things. So even though we're a small team, we're a team of 11 people at this time, and we'll likely triple or quadruple that as we go into a round of funding next year. But um, even with a small team, we still try and bring that same sort of thing so that we can attract talent. Because it's more and more, especially with millennials, when you're, when you're looking uh, for millennials, uh, it's not as much the salary anymore that's, that's, that's grabbing them or necessarily keeping them. You have to have a fair salary, but it's everything else around that. Millennials are caring about what, uh, what sort of impact they're having on the business. If they can't measure the impact, a large percentage of them will not last long in that position. They love to feel that they're making a difference, even if it's small and tangible. Um, and so we do a number of different things. We have like craft beer Fridays where you know everybody gets a couple tall boys on Fridays if they like it, or alternately juice, soda, whatever. And we we typically take a break for 20 to 30 minutes, crack a couple drinks, and, and chat over the lunch hour, or even outside it. And then people continue back to work, but they keep kind of having that camaraderie and that culture as they have a beer through a Friday afternoon. So that's one thing we brought in. The other thing we brought in was was like an annual team trip. And it's amazing what you can do on a budget if you do it well. We took our you know our entire team um, we took our entire team previously to uh, both Cuba and Florida. And it's amazing what you can do if you Airbnb a, a, a mansion for ten or fifteen people, how cheap it can get. Like four hundred dollars a night for fifteen people in a mansion in the US. It doesn't get better than that. Like that is cheap. 
right? So, uh, and, and bring in drinks and food and going on adventures, and uh, some of which the business covers, some of which employees, if they wanted to do excursions and things would do. But this, I can tell you, was incredible, the impact that it had on our employees. They came back, and it was like every single one of them had got a raise practice. They were, they were so much more energized, they bonded a lot more. Because we're broken up between a couple different offices right now with our team, they bonded a lot more that way, and it was just phenomenal. Like, if I can do it, we can afford to do it every single year. Maybe we can't travel as far, but still do trips locally, uh, the U.S., Canada, other areas of Canada, weekends, whatever it is. Highly recommend it. People look at the cost and they go, oh, "It's too expensive." Look at your turnover without doing stuff like that. Like, like you can contribute to that and reduce it is incredible. Time to open up the floor to the audience. So I'm going to sneak up here for a second. Okay, there we go. Questions from the floor. I'm going to put it over to Kate for the first one. Okay, so you've touched on having maybe a tech co-founder and you've talked a little bit about your team, but how did you really tackle the development work and attract that initial talent? And just could you also tell us if Hero Task is its own incorporated company or is it a product? It's a product like Apotheca. <laughs> no problem, I Apotheca. It's a bit of a mouthful. That's a perfect example. When we started, we named ourselves I Apotheca. Who oh, pretty? Not the greatest name and branding. Pharmacies used to be called apothecary, so that's where that plain words came, which is great from that sense. But a four-syllable word pitching it over the phone in sales is very difficult. So these are all things you learn as you go through the journey. But when we first started, we went on a segment of CBC's Dragons Den. Once we called ourselves I Apotheca on that show, we couldn't really change our name after that. So to answer your question, Hero Task is a product of I Apotheca. Because iApothecary is so focused on pharmacy, we, we, we found that it was going to be impossible for us to sell to both pharmacy and outside of that by having the HeroTask platform under the iApothecary brand and on its own website. So we branded it separately. It's the entire it's, it's, uh, same team entirely uh, and everything like that. It's, uh, it's not even another company. It's just a different product. So to answer your other question, how do we, I think you asked how did we get resources and developers in the early days? In Peterborough, Ontario, it's very difficult. Like, very difficult. Some of our developers have moved from Halifax. They've moved from, we had one move here um, that was from Pakistan, and then they were lived in Halifax for a few years and came here. We had one that uh, was in the UK and used to live here and moved back here. Uh, we had a couple others in the Durham region or other areas that commuted 20 minutes, 30 minutes, etc. It's very tricky. Developers are like, you know, if you're getting tired of your job right now and you want a job where you can make a ton of money and have a really interesting career, become a developer right now because even without school, you're starting at eighty or ninety thousand dollars without a degree. So, to answer your question, it's very difficult to get that tech talent. Salespeople, it's a little easier. Uh, actually, a lot easier. Um, uh, customer support, it's a little easier. Um, to get developers, being in the Durham region, we typically have to understand that um, that it would take four to six months to find a hire versus three to six weeks. And so we've had to prepare ourselves for that. And the other thing that's um, the other thing that's also difficult is that um, we we want to make sure that we're hiring as many people in the local area as possible. So that's what we're looking. That's what we're looking to do, but there's all sorts of different developers, and when there's a shortage of developers, it's hard to do so, so you have to start to pull people in from, from different areas and regions. Next question, coming up. Lucy, I see you there. Go ahead. Hi. Um, Hi. there. Question for you. So, innovation is key in terms of keeping up uh, and keeping ahead of the competition. How do you innovate? How do you find that next... Uh, module that you know improves on the previous one and how do you then connect that to a consumer need, a customer need? Yeah, that's that's a tricky one. Um, we were focused specifically on pharmacy as a niche and when you're in such a niche like that, it's easier to be competitive. What was hard on us is uh, if you follow healthcare in pharma and pharmacy and stuff in the news, their margins are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They're making 
like 20% of what they did five to eight years ago or 10 years ago, and it's getting worse and worse and worse every year right now. So it's very difficult. They're looking for revenue generating things versus revenue creating things. And when we're at a publicly funded healthcare system, sorry, like a, a government funded and, and uh, a copay and stuff, sort of healthcare system, um, a lot of the revenue generating activities come from things that are government involved and government endorsed. Uh, so, you know, most of our things focus on making the pharmacy more productive or making other businesses like for Hero Task, like grocery stores, retail businesses, any larger team more productive are more on the cost saving side so they can spend more time with revenue generating activities. As far as creating new and innovative tools, I would say that um, in a niche, it's as simple as getting in front of as many people as you can and asking them what their day-to-day -day problems are and going, oh, you know what, I can solve that with technology. Uh, I can solve that with this tool or that tool. And as you start to expand out, like we are now, to task management in a bigger target market, you have to really look at what your unique selling proposition is. For ours, it's our scalability. Other platforms aren't meant to allow you to assign and track work and improve productivity across teams of that involve tens or hundreds of people or even thousands. So that's where we see ourselves really succeeding. Other questions? Here we go. All right, just for the sake of participation, I just, uh, Spencer, uh, I knew you in 2012, man. Uh, we were in the same, I think, entrepreneurial class or something like that. You look familiar. <laughs> well, there you was go. It, was it the class or the incubator? Uh, no, actually, you were promoting the College Paint Pro thing. Oh, was, was I? Was. Okay. Yeah, so I don't even know if you are in our class, but you are doing a presentation on that. Yes. And and literally, like, 30 minutes before this started, my friend here, Janung, showed, said, hey, I'm going to Oshawa. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm going to see this guy talk. I'm like, Wait a sec, this guy Spencer, I knew him six years ago, right? So, so yeah, I mean, just a testimony to your, your progress, man. I mean, oh, thank I, you. I, I've kind of seen it, right? Which is awesome. Um, thank you. I don't know, maybe I'll mo ask more of an intrinsic question. Like, um, I'm a big believer in following your passion and doing things to the best of your ability and not making any assumptions or insistence about where things are leading. So, in the spirit of, like, following your greatest heart's desire in all this process, how did that play a role for you? That's a really good question, and uh, I that, that that's actually the perf probably the best question that anybody could ask me today because it's a plant, plant, plant. <laughs> yeah. six, six years in the making. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we headed into this direction of task management, and my two greatest passions that I have found, and, and they I really didn't know what they were three years ago, let alone six years ago. Um, when I got into building a business for pharmacy and healthcare, it wasn't, I love helping people. It wasn't so much that I loved the healthcare space. It was where I saw an opportunity. In the, in the first few years of the business, I was most passionate about the idea of business and creating something that could create jobs, dream jobs specifically for other people. And then my passion went in two different directions. One was I became obsessed with um, productivity not just in technology, but in other ways as well. How to, you know, better yourself, how to